to next. Wow, that's great. Well, my mother actually passed away just a couple months ago. Uh, she would have been 85 tomorrow. She was actually oh. born on Mother's Day. Wow. But, um, so, uh, but one thing about her is she was a remarkable woman in many ways, but um, when she was 17, she saw a picture in the newspaper. She lived in, she was born and raised in Toronto, and she saw a very moving picture um, about what was happening in China, um, the Japanese had invaded. Um, this picture so moved her that she had, um, she, she watched my down and enlisted immediately with the military. She was a quack. Canadian Women's Army Corps. She wrote the story to her doing that. So um, she, she was remarkable in many ways. And so when other kids were jumped at my mother wore running boots, I said, go door and run. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fun. My mother is an extraordinary woman. She is, she'll, she just turned 79. Yeah, 79. And uh, even with her illness, uh, she's doing remarkably well. She always helps everyone that she can. And she could do really anything, literally anything. And now that she's limited in her physical abilities, uh, due to Parkinson's, she's not able to do as much, but she still does a lot. She's just unbelievable. And she has been just so loving to the whole family. And it just comes through day after day. And I don't know where she gets it from, mm -hmm. you know? Probably from God. Thank you, Frank. It's beautiful. I, I know I have to take one more. This, this reason that I'm a mother is that my son <laughs> um, Hi, everybody. My name is Daniel Clark. I'm Reverend Mom. <laughs> when she says my son, she means it literally. <laughs> well, well, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't add a little add my, some of my own comments today, so let me just um, take this time. My mom has, you name it, she's done all kinds of things throughout her life. She's uh, been manager of a fitness, a fitness center, she's been a writer, she's been a musician, she was a teacher's assistant, you name it. But all her life, though, she has been very, her, her biggest devotion has been towards religion. And she, and that's, that's how I, that's how I, um, Excuse me. That's that's where I get most of my religious training from. You know, she always brought me up in Christ, and um, you know, she inspired me to become an altar server. And to this day, I'm actually singing with my own church's choir as well. And um, I've been very faithful to God. I owe I owe all that to my mom. She she brought religion not just to me, but to my family as well, to my whole family. And um, well, and she and she's a great person. I, I turn to her all the time whenever. Um, I'm not sure about things in my life and stuff like that. And I always talk with her, and she makes you feel, she, you know, she she doesn't uh, go hard on you or anything. She talks very honestly with you. Makes you feel, make, makes you feel great that you get the chance to speak with her because she has wonderful, she has a wonderful mind to share with you, and um, she's very passionate about her beliefs. And well, I can't think of a better Mother's Day gift for my mom than being able to live out her dream of actually serving her own mess. So, mom. <laughs> God bless you forever and now forever. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. That was very unexpected. <laughs> Thanks. I, I wrote it about. I didn't write it. <laughs> thirty seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, I wrote about thirty seconds ago. Thank you all for sharing. I love to hear such things. Life is an amazing experience, and I know we can probably tell a lot of stories. If some of you would like to share next week, Eric, uh, we will also be continuing with this. And uh, for the rest of the month, and I will continue with this show. Thank you. Ready? Okay. Let's talk about our readings for today. A very interesting cross section of readings. This one. First reading.
I agree with Mimi that when it's sudden and unexpected, it can have a bigger effect on your life. I think the Holy Spirit is pervasive and always there and always affecting us, that the Holy Spirit's grace is within all of us. But those unexpected, sudden moments, uh, I had an experience when I was uh, about 17, when I met an individual who had vanished in front of me. And I know that that was an experience of the Holy Spirit because at that point in my life, I needed some type of sign. And this was very sudden, very unexpected. And uh, I was able to be present to it and, and not be completely thrown by it and it reaffirmed my faith. So I think often the Holy Spirit is there to guide us, to provide signs, always there, but in those sudden, unexpected moments. And that gives us the ability, or the, um, yeah, I guess the ability to share that experience with others. And most people are impacted by sudden, unexpected yes. stories. And um, so anyway, so that's my feeling about the Holy Spirit, that it's always there, but can really have a big effect on you when it's a sign. I'm glad to hear this because what I was going to suggest is let's take a week off of our left brain thinking and our logical, analytical, masculine mind. Uh, and let's go a little more right brain this week, which is what you just described. It's more receptive, the more mystical side of our mind. And we're going to try to understand the Holy Spirit using that side of our brain a little bit more. So, we're going to go across the world for a little while. We're going to go to Asia and look at some of the terms that they use to describe their various uh, experiences of God consciousness. Okay. First term is, you may be familiar with it, the term enlightenment. Enlightenment. Buddhists call it Bodhi or Satori. There are similar terms in Islam among the Sufis and in Judaism in the Kabbalah tradition. Enlightenment, the acquisition of new wisdom, is a definition. Clarity of perception, brightening, brightening. Now, these are definitions, but we were actually going to have that experience described to us. What would that actual experience sound like? Could it sound like in Revelation when the mystics said, the city shimmered like a precious gem? Light filled all 
pulsing light. The mystics have often referred to the city, the word city, as a term to reflect their own soul or their, their being. So this experience of the mystic could have been reflecting his very being, being filled with light, enlightenment. Another term, samadhi. It's a Hindu and a Buddhist term. Samadhi is a non-dualistic state of consciousness where the consciousness of the subject and the consciousness of the object become as one. Now again, could Jesus have been saying that when he told them, on that day you will know that I am in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you? Subject and object become one. Any questions so far? <laughs> Another term, mantra, liberation, the release from all suffering, the end of the cycle, the end of all worldly limitations. Some people call it nirvana. I don't think any of us could possibly imagine something like that. So, if we were to imagine what it would feel like, it sound to us as though God was saying that. And he said in the Song of Solomon, Arise, my beloved, the beautiful one, and come. Go into its path, the rains are all the world. Flowers have appeared in our land. So the point I'm trying to bring out for us is, I would say that when Jesus was promising the Holy Spirit, you could even look at it almost like an umbrella term for all of these amazing, wonderful experiences that are not only for Christians. The enlightenment experience, liberation, Jesus was inviting everyone to experience those things. And I don't think it was limited to just the disciples or the apostles. I think it's still for everyone even today, no matter where you live in the world. But if you specifically follow the teachings of Jesus, let's say, his particular hand will be in them. But there is also the enlightenment experiences in Asia and in Europe and all places all over the world. So when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, I believe he was sending that enlightenment experience. And that's probably why at the beginning they thought the apostles were drunk. They were so inebriated with their freedom and their newfound happiness and joy. There was no other way to describe it. I'm going to uh, make an analogy um, to ask a question. In I don't know how many people are familiar with the film Amadei. Just saw it last night. Can you imagine? Just <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, Salieri was not as talented a composer as Mozart. Yeah. But he had this love and this dedication to God that he wanted to produce beautiful music. And he just could do it in the same way that Mozart could, Mozart being somebody that Salieri saw as you know, a spoiled child, um, unworthy of being God's voice uh, to the world. And try as he might, Salieri couldn't equal what Mozart could create. And so the analogy I want to make is for us, how do we, how do we, what can we do, how can we access the spirit if it's, if we are like Salieri and we are trying and trying and trying? Is it possible? Or is it just something that randomly happens to people like Mozart and there's no common reason to it? I guess you when know, I was studying many years ago with a Franciscan order, I used to look at the four clear nuns. I was with a secular Franciscan order for ladies. Uh, they could be married or single, but as long as they were devoted to St. Francis, they would join the four clear nuns at a monastery. We would meet and pray together and study the book. I used to look at them, Anthony, the nuns in this monastery, and say, oh my God, how? There's no way in the world I could ever think myself to be in such a position that they could 
pray all day and all night and smile and never leave the monastery. And here I was married and I had all of the comforts of a home. And I think I would, I would wonder and wonder and then I said to myself, but there was something I had read in the Bhagavad Gita a while back and it said, better one's own dharma, however poorly lived, than the dharma of someone else, however well you think you can live that. So for me to go away and go to a monastery somewhere, yeah, I would have loved it. You know, what an ideal life in, in my mind. That's not what I was here to do. You know, I was here to live this life. The Dharma means your duty of the life. This was the life I lived, I lived. So when I see myself falling short and all these are the things I pray about it, and being exactly where you are, I think, is being receptive to the Spirit because it's your truth and it's where you're meant to be in this life. Is that helpful? <laughs> uh, I have a couple of comments to it. Anthony says one of them is that Amadeus is a fictional representation. Salieri was every bit as gifted a composer as Mozart, but Mozart had some extra something. It's a great analogy. But Salieri's music is utterly beautiful and highly recommended. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I've just come back, and Chris DiGiorgio also, who just came back from a week with Saima, who is an enlightened master. And she would say, she does say all the time to us, each one of us is already enlightened. But as we walk through our lives, in, her, in the case of her teaching many lives, we, have, we acquire layers, we become like an onion. So the true light within is covered over by, by our actions through our life or through our lifetimes. And that the process of enlightenment is peeling away those layers and you have a teacher like her, so that instead of having to go one layer at a time, which is unfortunately what happens to someone like me anyway, she can just slice right through to get you to the center. Uh, it's very, very painful work sometimes. It doesn't have to be, because I, I, mean, I get torn for myself between just the experience of joy, which you can step into in a heartbeat, and I think that's part of what the Holy Spirit brings to us. But also the, the recognition that we live our lives covered over by these beliefs and by this these things that hold us back from stepping into that truth, or what Rusty would say is the thing that keeps us from our direct, excuse me, direct vision of God or our own true path. And there are so many things that it doesn't even, everybody knows their own. And sometimes we don't know our own, and all of a sudden we get this great insight, oh, that's stopping me from living in joy. And we can take that layer away. And the, the process for us normal human beings is sadhana or practice. It's a practice. It's meditation. It's prayer. It's developing a spiritual practice. And you don't have to be a nun or a monk and live in a monastery and pray all day long. We live in the world, most of us. So how do we take the expression, the experience of being that light, that whatever wind that went through me, that expression of light? And when you said we don't think we can imagine it, I think you're right. I don't think we can imagine it, but I think we can in tiny glimpses of, oh, and in those moments, have an idea. The problem is that as we get closer and closer to living there, it gets so much more painful not to. And unfortunately, we spend more time in the not state. So it's a question of practice, practicing openness, practicing peeling away the layers, practicing stepping into a different concept of belief system, stripping away everything we've ever been told to be open to something different. And who knows what that is? Thank you. I'm just touching on that. <clears throat> I'm, I'm you know, hearing about the, the religions that we were speaking about before. And the first thing that comes to my mind is that, is that these, these religious people do meditate. Yes. And I think that that's the only way that you're ever going to get to that place. And it's just not part of our, our lives. It, it, I think it's way more part of, of Eastern culture and, and their religious practices and not a part of our own. I would like to know if they're, I mean, I, I'm not looking for the quick fix, but, you know, it, 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 without doing that, I, I don't see how we, we're really going to get that spirit or, or get that direction or any, or any of it without really, and, and getting to that happiness, to that core and all of that. I don't think you can get to that without, you know, separating. Um, everyday life and what we go through within everyday life. Right. But, we, but we in the West don't do that. As, as a practice, we don't do it. So then, we, then what? What it is is um, 
the terms sometimes get a little confused too. It, they call it meditation in the East, whereas meditation in the West, where we are, they would they would tell you is more like read a, a passage and then think about it. But what we call it in the West, meditation in the East, is contemplation. But that's yeah, contemplation. Mm -hmm. So what you would do is, if you do your <coughs> praying or uh, reading a scripture, whatever makes you feel centered, whether it's uh, something you need to physically do. Okay, that's one avenue. But then there's also a sunrise or a sunset or sitting in front of your fireplace, you know, some place that stills that thinking mind. That's what I was trying to say about the left brain. We let that left brain, that thinking logical mind, just relax. It doesn't mean it's going to stop thinking. Your mind will always have thoughts. But you just don't attach yourself to the thought. Mm -hmm. You let the thoughts kind of come and go, like you might do if you're sitting on a beach somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know? That's meditation. And you can do that, you can start out like 10 minutes, because a lot of us don't have a lot of time. But then you, before you know it, you'll be feeling so good by doing that. Mm -hmm. It become 20 minutes. You, want to or you might do it morning and evening. And that's where you start to live from. So it becomes more of a pleasure to live there, you know, than now thinking about how would I ever be able to do that. And that would be your right brain, being receptive, being alive. I think someone here, did you have a question? The place where Jesus and the Eastern thought of the, the Dharma is the explorer, is in, in, a, in a concept that's very good for this church because Rusty and Eric, coming from theater backgrounds, matter of fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he suffered in mission. Captain Rusty is also from a theater background. And the concept of theater is the idea of living a script to become the character that you are playing. And within that particular framework, you can look and see Jesus himself said, uh, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. If you give it up, then you'll gain it. The idea is you're giving up a particular script that you got from your previous life. You let that character die, and you resurrect that character as a new being, and then you go on with that new being. And if that being has to be changed, so be it. So what the Eastern side is calling Dharma, we can call it script. And a script resurrection is something that occurs again and again. And it's a place where Jesus definitely meets the Eastern thought and the whole concept of enlightenment. Thank you. Hmm. Always a pleasure to hear from you. <laughs> Elizabeth, did you want to say? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to yeah, piggyback on to what you were saying. Um, I think you've used some really key words the, or ideas that the right brain as a, as a way into it and being centered in yourself. I don't meditate, but I do write. And I have had incredible, for want of a better word, mystical experiences while writing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not thinking about anything, but it seems to me that part of what this is is um, you are, or I was, in a state where I'm the happiest or the, the best me I can be, and something happens. You're not thinking about it. It just kind of comes over you. And um, that's how it, that's what it feels like to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that sense of being wrapped, um, being elevated, being carried out. Never had the experience. Well, I think, no. you know, I think I would love to get when it. You're, I think when you're doing what you love best, what feels like the center of your life, Yay. that's where I think. She agrees with me. I think that's when the possibility exists. And it could be anything. It could be, but it's that. You being centered—that um, I think is where it happens. Sometimes I agree with Elizabeth, uh, but sometimes you need a tool or a way in. And uh, recently, I started taking a meditation course in White Plains, a yoga meditation course. I'm in my fifth week, and I find it just completely amazing. And part of it is, like Mimi said, peeling away the onion, and the enlightenment is. There is left brain and right brain thinking, and part of this process of uh, this particular form of yoga, Sahaja Yoga, mm -hmm. is to raise your kundalini or your spirit by balancing those two sides of yourself, the male, the female, 
the left brain, the right brain. Yeah. And there are all ways within a matter of minutes to feel this oneness with energy. And part of it is what Anthony was saying before about Salieri. I think in the scene where he was just so amazed by the way Mozart performed the piece, he knew that he was envious of it, but he knew that Sal uh, that Mozart's gift was a gift from God. And part of it is recognizing that other people without trying and that you can't try to think the spirit. You just have to try to accept yourself to accept it and you could perhaps act, perhaps access it. It's not a guarantee. So part of my normal thinking is trying to control things, think it through, analyze it. But when I submit and when I become less of myself, and in this particular type of yoga, it's becoming thoughtless, which is anathema to me. I never want to be thoughtless, I think, but that's the way really toward being more open. But one other thing about meditation, I believe very strongly in the uh, Christianity and that one of Jesus' message was to share with each other and that we are all agents of God. And perhaps we have some divinity within us to do that. And that in this meditation, this particular meditation is in group, it's a collective yeah. meditation. And there is a vibration or an energy that comes from the others, and the others are catalysts in helping you through it. So in that form, and the founder, Sri Mataji from India, uh, she has, um, she was born and raised a Catholic, and she believes in, in Jesus Christ. So it's not one that you have to be completely, uh, you, you, don't, you can, the two can exist very easily together. And just one other, one other quick point. Um, on ABC, there was a special, uh, you may have seen Seeing is Believing, 2020, right? Uh, um, and the point that I got from, from the beginning was Ama, she has hugged 22 million people. And through a simple hug, she has so impacted so many people, the 22 million that she hugged, and then the millions beyond that. And just a simple act, very non-smart, or very left, not left brain oriented. You know what I mean? Not thinking, just very easy and simple. Well, I know the yogis say there are self-realized masters that come to Earth. The self-realized masters mean that they are complete already in body, mind, and soul. They come to Earth every, every so many years, let's say, when the Earth is really in need of it, and they come for a special purpose. And I believe today there are uh -oh. masters still living on the Earth, right? Ba Baba, oh, yeah. Babaji, Bye, Baba, Babaji, Ma, and, yeah. and even though they're silent at times, their presence alone upon the Earth, I think, really radiates. I love my name next you know, Thursday. Actually, if you ever are interested in reading one, a, one hour the challenge in deeply called Power versus Force, he makes the argument, David Hawkins, he's an MD, PhD, who became enlightened spontaneously and then went and hid for 20 years because he couldn't handle what he experienced, and slowly started to write his findings. Um, he says he actually has calibrated <coughs> vibrational frequencies of awareness, starting with zero being no consciousness and a thousand being Christ consciousness and enlightenment being 700 to a thousand. So there are different levels of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Attaining enlightenment is just the first step of it. But anything below that, mm -hmm. because he claims that above 350 is the level of duality. So 350 and above, you cease to be you and me. You become us. And at 200 is the level of uh, a different kind of consciousness. Most of the world vibrates below 200 in his calibration. But for every person who vibrates above, there's a certain number of people that are pulled up by that. And you can see that being around someone like Ma, who vibrates obviously at the level of enlightenment, whether it's 700 or 900, I couldn't tell you. But the more people she touches, the more people are lifted up, and like Amachi as well. The love vibration, the vibration of love above 500 is so powerful that you can't help but be shifted by it and lifted up. And it's an exponential scale. So if you go from 200 to 205, it's a leap. It's a huge leap. <coughs> and, uh, by the way, Amachi comes to New York once a year, and you can all go get hugged by her.
That sounds beautiful. In July, I think. Evan? I see all that as very nice to you, actually. Yeah. Um, but I don't understand how, I mean, aside from you know, being able to experience you know, the person in, in the presence, I don't see how that's going to make any difference in my life. Um, and the only thing uh, of what we discussed this morning, the only thing that makes a lot of sense to me is what Ray said about the scripts. And I, although I have to follow that because I don't, I don't have any sense of previous lives. And I don't have any sense of, you know, the, the reincarnation thing. So I can't. Um, wrap my mind around rewriting a script from a previous life. Yeah. Um, your previous life is this moment, but I can think of it as okay, what script did my grandparents write for me? Mm -hmm. What script did my parents write for me? What script does my child write for me? Mm -hmm. What script does my partner write for me? And are those the scripts that I want to continue to play? Yes, you can do that. And it's, it's not based on your belief system, let's say. It's what, how you process your life, okay? Because if it was based on a belief system, it would be very hard for you know, most of us to all have the same belief system, okay? It's based on how you process in your life. And as you said, if the idea of the script appeals to you, you can take it from that moment or from your relationships in life, absolutely. Uh, and that's interesting that you mentioned that special. They did say in that special that as they were studying the brain, they were finding that apparently it seems certain people's minds are more wired, is how they put it, more wired to accept things on faith gotcha. uh, than others. So I guess this is what we've all been given, and maybe for those of us who have more uh, faith <laughs> wiring for some reason, we can process things a bit differently. But it certainly doesn't leave out people who don't. You know, you have your own processes in life, and you can reach God as readily as, as any of us. I was there someone else? I'm going to wrap it up in a minute. But was there someone else? No? Okay. You yeah. have I'm trying to come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing I'll say that I like the analogy of the, um, of the script and everything. Because being, being a man of theater myself, I relate to it very well. And um, the gentleman over there was saying about uh, which, which scripts would we accept and things like that we want to uh, be part of. I think that's very good. Very good analogy, actually, because you know, we're given all these scripts by different people and stuff. And sometimes we think we'll just follow them along. We we'll, 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 can't see what's wrong. Why it's written out for us? We don't have to do much thinking. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this much: look, over, you look over the role first, and if it doesn't appeal to you, make sure make sure you don't take it, or else you're going to be stuck with it all the while. So, uh, <laughs> that, but. Um, but yeah, I think I think in life you can also be you can also be the um, casting director yourself in addition to being in addition to being the player. Um, case in point, I'm actually trying to I'm just, uh, trying to you know share knowledge that I've been given both by you and by the church itself and stuff with uh, with friends of mine. And just this past um, this past month or so, when it was time, when around the around the time of the Divine Mercy Novena. Um, I, I posted a message on those of you who might be familiar with the site on MySpace. MySpace is kind of like a community site for those who don't know. Well, I posted a message that would be addressed to all of my my friends on that site, and uh, I talked to tell them about the Divine Mercy, tell them you know how to do it, how to go through and stuff. And I was surprised by how, how many people responded to it, or at least. At least, you know, how many people wrote back to me saying, well, thank you for telling me about this, because you don't realize how many people, uh, you know, really have beliefs like that or, or are religious until you propose it to them like that. And one such person is a teenager who lives in Los Angeles. I never met him personally, but um, um, he, he found me after I, uh, some time ago, I had, um, I had gone to San Francisco after winning a, uh, a video game contest. Also, I was captivated by he was also very religious. So next thing I know, I find myself talking about religion with him, and 
but it, it seems unlikely that two, two people who need to do Mortal Kombat in video games <laughs> <laughs> of all things. <laughs> and I'm talking about something as profound as, as religion stuff. Well, long well, story short though, it, it, uh, it, got, it got their attention and I guess I felt that um, you know, after having done that, I guess they put me in a little bit of, I guess, a position of, well, well, well I guess a position of importance among them, I guess. I mean, I had my regular friends already, but then the people who I haven't met personally, but I've even met through there and stuff, I got to communicate with them for that, so, um, yeah, you'd be, you'd be surprised. You can really, you can really bring in a lot of people and actually, um, I'm just, I'm just probably going to make one more point with them. I'm very proud of you. Very good. Thank you very much for your participation. This was a beneficial aspect. Thanks for your patience, by the way. Thanks for sharing.